way, a miracle was how we managed to go as far as we did without ever um, having to refer back to public support. I'll, I'll close with a, a quote on this uh, from the British politician and Indian administrator, Lord Macaulay. Tr free trade, one of the greatest blessings that a government can bestow on a people is in almost every country unpopular. He wrote those words in 1824. And I submit that there hasn't been a moment in the intervening 200 years when it hasn't been true. Now, that's a very interesting take, Daniel. I think there's a lot of truth to that. So, so Tori, what do you think about Daniel's assertion? Feel free to comment on that, that maybe policy is just now catching up with public opinion. Um, so feel free to comment on that or add something else about why you think trade might be um, waning over the last yeah. decade. Thank you so much, Adam. Um, okay, so I'm going to comment really quickly, and then I'll get into what I had prepared to say. Um, and I think I think you're hitting on on a on a great point there, Daniel. And um, it's interesting here in the U.S. Um, that actually public support for free trade has remained very high and very constant um, over the last, say, 20 to 25 years. Every you know Pew Research poll out there, it it remains relatively high. It's just the political um, you know, which, which political party is supporting uh, changes with the tides. So that's something I have to add there. The other thing I wanted to add for some context um, uh, to the panel is that we have to make sure that we're looking at the whole picture of trade, um, not just trade in goods, which is the, what the numbers were that you were referring to earlier, Adam. So I think that a big change that happened, obviously after the turn of the century, and then even more exponentially over the last 10 to 15 years is a shift from traditional goods trade to services trade to trading capital. I mean, so let me let me toss these numbers out here really quick. Um, so you had mentioned the, the goods trade number, but when you take goods and services world exports, $29.9 trillion, markedly higher than just the goods. Um, and, and then we're not even talking about the import side either, right? Because Trade is more than just selling stuff, it's buying stuff as well. That's $24.3 trillion in world imports um, and $1.6 trillion in, in um, world FDI inflows. So we're talking about huge growth. And if you look at these charts, I mean, it is exponential growth. You see a little bit of jagged, um, you know, when it comes to the financial crisis and economic downturns, but, but when you look at how trade used to be even 20 years ago to today when you bring in those 21st century trade items um it's it's growing more than ever it's growing just as much on that same trajectory um as, as it had in the past and it had in the past but in an exponential way so i think it's important for us to um to look beyond the goods um and know that trade is still increasing and what we need to be doing as policymakers as advocates for free trade is, is pointing out that this growth is happening and pointing out where the gains from trade are. Because a lot of times politicians focus just on exports when actually for you and me as individuals, the gains from trade is actually on the import side. Yeah, I think that's a great point, Tori. And thank you for correcting me on those numbers, but you're absolutely right. One of the things I get very annoyed about is when people talk about uh, trade deficits without thinking about the services and the foreign direct investment and all the other things that factor into those numbers. So that's an excellent point. Um, Dan, so your thoughts on this, maybe trade is not waning as much as I actually uh, initially implied at the beginning of this conversation. Um, so is there, is there a problem? Is the problem smaller than maybe I, I, I am implied initially? You're, you're on mute, Dan. Yes, I, th I think the problem may be smaller. Uh, the numbers that uh, uh, Tori shared from um, World Bank of goods and services combined, if you look at the increase from 2008 to 2019, it's 25% growth, so not insignificant. What we had for a period of time in the 90s and 2000s with a very rapid pace of globalization was that trade was growing quite a bit faster than world GDP. Trade was outpacing the economy. And maybe now it's coming back more into relationship with the economy. And I don't know that that's, that, that should be a real surprise, but it, it is, I think it is what's happening. In response to your historical perspective, let me go back just a little bit further than the end of World War II, because there are some parallels between what we had at the Great Depression and what we have now. Uh, 
you know, Hoover was the most protectionist president until Trump, okay? And the, the Smoot-Hawley tariff that he signed in 1930 helped to deepen and lengthen the Great Depression. Then an experienced democratic relatively free trade president, Franklin, Franklin Roosevelt came in with a very conscious desire to try to unwind the trade restrictions that, uh, that Hoover had put in place. And uh, he got the Reciprocal Trade Agreements Act signed in 1934. Uh, they negotiated until the end of World War II with some 27 countries, reductions mutually in tariffs. And that helped give some momentum going into the founding of the GATT. So, it, you know, if we compare the, that to the current situation, it was a lot more favorable back then in terms of attitude and approach, because now we have a democratic administration that wants to work with allies, but doesn't really want to re lower trade barriers to allow that to happen comfortably. And, you know, so the, the, the democratic administration that we have now simply hasn't learned as much as one would have, might have hoped from what Roosevelt and his Secretary of State Cordell Hall were able to accomplish with a very conscious effort to engage with allies, lower tariffs, create a world of greater cooperation. May, may I add something to that? Because I think this point that, that Tory also mentioned about the way it changes in a partisan fashion is fascinating. I, I've noticed, you guys will know more about this than I do, but I've noticed in conversations with conservative friends in the US that Trump definitely impacted how conservative Republicans talked about trade. But on the flip side, he, he made a few Democrats much more pro-free trade than they had been. Now, I'm not the expert there, but I, I noticed a very similar uh, dynamic playing out after Brexit. Um, the people who pre-2016, when we had the referendum, would have seen themselves as cosmopolitan internationalist free traders started becoming very much uh, wary of global trade because they associated it with Brexit. They couldn't stand the thought of Brexit succeeding, and they didn't like the people who they saw advocating for it. But the flip side of that is that there was a certain kind of UKIP voter who pre-2016 would have been saying, oh, I don't like the idea of uh, French energy companies owning our strategic infrastructure. It's very bad for national security. Suddenly, they were all for global Britain because they wanted to make Brexit work. And that dynamic has not finished playing out. I mean, I'm, I'm talking to you from Parliament here, and w we're debating the UK-Australia deal that has just been uh, agreed. And, uh, you know, frankly, the, the opposition benches are full of people who are now uh, just determined that Brexit should fail. And so they're coming up with the most incredibly spurious arguments about, you know, uh, lower, imagine lower welfare, animal welfare in Australia and this kind of nonsense. It's really just because they don't like Brexit. But, but here's a difference between, um, maybe between this, the Smoot-Hawley debates and now. I think that the COVID uh, pandemic and the associated lockdowns have thrown us back even more on these kind of paleolithic heuristics. They've made us even more resistant. You know, we, we, in, a, in a crisis, people become warier, more introverted. You know, we, we, we avoid strangers because they might carry pathogens. We want to keep an eye on our kids and we want to hunker down. And that, you know, translated into policy means closed borders, closed shops, and above all, self-reliance. And I, I don't know about you guys, but I have lost count of how many people in the UK who were previously pretty dependable free marketeers who during the epidemic have been saying things to me like, well, yeah, but surely, Hannon, even you, even you must now see why we need to grow more of our own food. I mean, seriously? I mean, that's, that's your take on the I mean, you know, the one thing that worked beautifully was international trade in food. By the way, thank heaven from our point of view, right, that the, the first lockdown happened during the period that British farmers call the hungry gap, right? So between late March and early May, we basically don't produce much food in this country, right? We, we've reached the end of the winter crops. We, we're not making any more turnips and cabbages and potatoes. We haven't reached the harvest yet. So had it not been for the ability to buy whatever we wanted from around the world from a secure variety of diverse suppliers, <laughs> we'd have been living on rhubarb and asparagus uh, and maybe a bit of, 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 of nettle soup, right? I had hoped that this scramble for vaccines would have removed the stigma uh, of imports, right? Would have made the point that Tory just made, that, that 
the, the good thing about trade is that it, it, it means you can get stuff cheaply and, and, and competitively. But of course, that, that's running up against these caveman instincts and reason always ends up giving way to intuition. So I'm afraid, however irrationally, however illogically, those of us who think as we do on this panel are going to be in for a very tough time in the months ahead. Yeah, so there's two, there's two threads here going on. I want to, I want to go after both of them a little bit. Um, so Tori, to you first, um, you know, you brought up the shift, Daniel brought up the shift and, and Dan did about the Republicans maybe looking more like they're anti-free trade now and the Democrats potentially being more free trade. First of all, how more to reality is that? So, you know, Trump did a lot of steel tariffs, aluminum tariffs, a lot of Buy American provisions. And my understanding is that Biden has maintained most of those. So is, is it really true that we're seeing a shift to Democrats potentially being more free trade? Or is there a lot more similarity uh, when it comes to policy than maybe meets the eye? Well, I think during the Trump administration, you saw, you saw a shift um, in being anti-Trump. So, uh, so Democrats were, you know, opposed to pretty much everything that the Trump administration did, and therefore you were by default potentially a little bit more free trade than you were previously. But it wasn't necessarily a deeply held belief, I don't think. Um, and, and on the other side, a lot of Republicans um, were concerned about speaking out about their values of free trade. Um, you know, afraid of going the way of Harley Davidson um, in criticizing, you know, policies of the Trump administration. And now I think you're seeing a little bit of a resurgence in uh, folks on the right um, being more vocal about free trade, criticizing, um, you know, the continued existence of Section 301 tariffs, Section 232 tariffs. Um, and I think you'll probably see more than that. And I know at the Heritage Foundation, we are going to take this as an opportunity to really re-educate members about why they should be supporting free trade and they should be vocal about supporting free trade and communicating to their constituents why free trade benefits them and what it allows them to have the freedom to do. Um, because otherwise you could lose a lot of individuals to really misinformation about where the gains for trade and who's winning um, uh, on trade. Yeah, so that's a great question. So Dan, I'll kick this to you, who's winning, right? So, so Trump often described his tariffs as helping America win. I don't know exactly who the opponent was, but we were supposedly winning. Um, who has gained and who's lost from these tariffs on steel, aluminum, and, and the resulting tariffs that have come from other countries? Yeah, just going back to what Daniel had said, President Trump was such a proud protectionist. He was very comfortable with his caveman instincts that pushed him in that direction. What we have now with the Biden administration, it seems to me, are somewhat closet protectionists. They really don't want to admit that they're being protectionist, but they've got certain constituencies in their parties that really like the tariffs. And so let's just hush hush and keep things as they are. So, um, but you're asking what, what have been the, the, the costs? Well, uh, the, um, uh, the Tax Foundation uh, did a uh, research uh, back in uh, last September that showed some um, $80 billion of additional taxes that had been paid by, by the U.S. importers and uh, a net loss of around 180,000 jobs because of the tariffs that we had imposed on ourselves. Then you want to look also at the retaliatory tariffs and uh, the analysis there uh, showed somewhere around uh, 95 billion dollars of exports that previously had not been encumbered by high tariffs now were. And uh, that had led to the loss of another $30,000, uh, 30,000 jobs. So the costs are pretty great. And the, the best analysis that I've seen indicates that there was about a thousand job increase in steel mill employment in the United States. A lot of jobs lost to, to, to get those few great gains. Yeah, can I jump in here really quick? Yeah, sure. Go ahead, Tori. And just, uh, I just want to like tell a quick anecdote to folks that I just think really illustrates this idea of the winners and losers when the government gets involved in trade. So take Whirlpool, for example, um, major washer manufacturer here in, here in the U.S., um, located in Ohio. Uh, they advocated like crazy for washer tariffs under Section 201, uh, safeguard tariffs. Um, like crazy because those horrible 
you know, Japanese and Korean uh, washer manufacturers were just too much competition for them, apparently. Um, I'm being sarcastic here, of course. And I love Korean and Japanese companies. Um, but they were advocating like crazy for washer tariffs. Got them, right? Yay for Whirlpool. And then got slammed with steel tariffs which is a prominent input for making a washing machine and said, oh, the steel tariffs, they're really hurting our bottom line. They're hurting our profits. They're costing us millions of dollars. This is the problem with protectionism, right? We want to have tariffs for us, but not for anyone else. And when somebody else gets tariffs for them and they negatively affect us, well, then we're opposed to tariffs because they're bad. Um, and this is why government intervention in these areas doesn't help anyone in the long run. And at the very end of the day, you and I get to pay the cost for all of that protectionism. Right. Doesn't help anyone, right? That's the key thing. And I I, I, I was an elected politician for 21 years. So I, I, I'll, I'll spell out exactly what the problem is. Uh, those thousand steel workers whose jobs have been propped up, as Dan said, know who they are and will vote accordingly. The 10,000, 20,000, 100,000 people who have suffered, uh, may have, uh, have suffered either by losing their jobs or just through uh, a deterioration in their living standards, they have no idea who they are. And the jobs that would have come into existence without those tariffs, well, obviously they can't vote, right? They only exist in the subjunctive. So you're always going to have this, this classical problem of you know, dispersed uh, gains and concentrated losses, but especially exacerbated when, as in the case of steel uh, or agriculture, you have a, an industry that is both politically connected and that has a sentimental hold on public opinion, right? Because mo most, for, for some reason, we're nostalgic. We're much more upset about uh, jobs in the steel sector than we are about uh, jobs in a call center or whatever, and, and, and politicians are, are sensitive to all that. So what's the solution? It seems to me the only really practical thing you can do is nothing succeeds like success, is you, you implement the policies so successfully that, 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 that you convince by the prosperity that you unleash, right? So you, you don't get any New Zealand farmers now saying, oh, let's go back to having the old system. You, you, you sound, I mean, they, you know, when, when those changes were, were introduced, they were behaving like French farmers, blockading everything and, you know, but nobody wants to go back now. And, and one thing which I think we can practically work towards, I don't know if, we've, if we're gonna have time to, to talk about this a bit, Adam, but I hope we do, is the, the capacity to get a US-UK free trade agreement, something that the British government is very keen on. Uh, we are each the biggest investor in the other's country. We're each the biggest trader with the other, for all the obvious reasons, right? Com communities of language and law and accountancy systems and all the rest of it. But because until now, British trade policy was controlled by the EU, we haven't been able to do the trade deal because we were held back by defensive interests of continental countries, films, farming, steel, textiles, etc. cetera. Uh, none of those things really exist. We could have a really cutting edge trade deal. But the, my question to you, I guess, and my, my, my concern is I'm not sure that the same will is there on the other side. I, th I think there are some people around the president who still kind of, I don't know, they don't want to reward us for Brexit. They, they, they regard it as a kind of slap in the face to, to the, 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 the global order, you know. And of course, there is a, in this administration, there is a constituency of people who uh, who have decided to make the whole thing about imagined problems in Ireland. So I don't know if that's, uh, if the economics or the politics will win on that, but I'd be interested in your take. No, I definitely, so I, I definitely want to get to that because I think we want to talk about what are, what are some steps we can do to maybe, um, you know, get people back on board with free trade and how can we make sure that free trade is part of the, the, the world order going forward. So I definitely want to touch on that, but I want to hit on something else that you mentioned earlier, um, the supply chain issue. So you're seeing the same conversations here in America that you're probably that you were seeing in the UK that you discussed. Um, we need to produce more of our medicine at home. So we had toilet paper shortages, we had meat shortages, we have microchip shortages now, and then the automobile lines are shutting down and people are being furloughed in their jobs. So is it is it true that trade is no longer reliable? Our international supply chains are not resilient enough for the modern world, or can free trade potentially even make them more resilient 
So I'll kick it over to you, Dan, first for your take on how, how what's this conversation? How does this, how does trade fit in with these supply chain discussions we're having? Well, the uh, pandemic really has caused a lot of rethinking of supply chains, and I have uh, been impressed with the uh, amount of um, reconsideration going on within commercial firms about how dependent do they want to be on single source supplies from any country. Okay. So there's strong commercial pressures that have come out of the pandemic to reorient supply chains in ways that make them more resilient, which may mean continuing to have some uh, supply out of China, but also some out of Canada or even the United Kingdom. Uh, and uh, um, so, so without the government doing anything to encourage reshoring, there's some of that happening that where production is tending to shift to what would be considered reliable countries or just a broader diversity of countries so that any type of shock that might enter the system is more easily handled. Tori, or Daniel, yeah. comment, Tori, looks like you have something to add. Yes, please. Um, okay, so I'm gonna come, come to you with more anecdotes here. And I think that the pandemic was a perfect example and there are so many anecdotes that you can tell about how actually the market did respond to the shocks. The shocks happened and free trade does not absolve us of shocks. It's a natural part of the way that the market works. And the market allows us to respond to the shocks much faster than say the government can respond to those shocks. So take for example, PPE. All right, the US has over 300 million people. 99.9% .9 of them were not wearing masks in March, 2020. Um, and then all of a sudden, all these states put in mask mandates, there's federal mask mandates, and 300 million people need face masks. And if, I bet if you were to go on Etsy right now, you would find hundreds of new Etsy shops producing face masks. Every major multinational clothing producer started producing face masks. Um, and yes, they were not you know, pennies on the dollar, per face mask what they may have been before, but everyone was producing face masks because they saw a demand for it that did not exist before. And now all those face masks are on clearance because the demand is decreasing because people are getting vaccinated. So I think that's a perfect example of, you know, the market did, um, the, it did respond. And, you know, we talk about this issue of, okay, is globalization not working as much anymore? Also in, in the tech space. So the idea of the issue of data global or uh, data localization. So should a should a data center be located in the country where the data is collected, or can it be located somewhere else? And uh, what we found is that in that particular context, it has more to do with how the data is secured than where it's located. And as Dana was mentioning with supply chains, it's about diversification because during the pandemic, almost every country in the world had factory shutdowns. Um, we were not absent from that. My dad's tool and die company in Michigan shut down for like six weeks um, and they couldn't be supplying parts to the auto industry anymore. So whether that shutdown was happening here in the US or in Mexico or in Europe or in Asia, it was affecting everyone. And having that factory in the US clearly would not have helped the, the products get online any faster. Yeah, go ahead. One, of the, one of the many ways in which we're, we're up against intuition is the idea that security does not depend on autarky. And that is a very, very difficult idea, however often it's demonstrated. If you produce everything in one place, you are vulnerable to a local shock or a local disruption, even if that one place happens to be in your own territory. And so if you actually want food supply, food security, the answer is not to try and produce it all, but to purchase from all over the world so that someone is always going to be wanting to sell you their surplus. And that is true of vaccine equipment, uh, of materials, PPE, etc. That was a difficult argument to win even in 2019. It has become much, much harder now, however irrationally. But you've only got to think about how, if we followed through the logic of trying to produce everything ourselves, and we filled every inch of storage, every container with you know, masks and gloves and materials for vaccines and all the rest of it. And then a different kind of crisis material, a different bug even. And suddenly we've got all the wrong stuff. That You can see very easily why that's a bad uh, model. And I mean, if you like one way of demonstrating this 
by pointing to the, the extremes, there is a country in the world that has elevated self-sufficiency to the ruling principle of policy, and that's North Korea, Juche. Import substitution is, is literally the state ideology, right? At the other end of that scale, you have someone like Singapore, doesn't produce one edible ounce, barely, right? Imports its food, its drinking water, its electricity, right? Where would you rather live, right? Uh, Singapore has the cheapest and most secure food supplies in the world because they've overcome the caveman instinct and they've understood that diversity of supply actually makes you more secure. Now, are we ever going to win that argument from first principles? I doubt it. But can we demonstrate it to be true by just going ahead and, and being ambitious? Well, there I'm a little bit more hopeful. Yeah, I think so. I, so I completely agree, right? I think just to put a bow on this, I, I think the consensus here, at least on this panel, is that um, international supply chains actually make us more resilient to these shocks that Tori is talking about. And, and maybe there are some tweaks that need to occur, but I think. The idea is that the, the market participants will figure out exactly what those tweaks are, whether they mean more resiliency, more redundancy in their supply chains. Maybe they need several countries supplying rather than one or two. Um, ultimately, hopefully that stuff will work itself out in the market without the government heavy, without the government's heavy hand coming in and trying to manipulate where the supply chains are and how exactly they work and everything like that. Um, one other thing I wanted to touch on here real quick before we get into some, uh, some Q&A is often you hear people who, who say they they don't support free trade, they support fair trade. So it's not that they're against trade, they like trade, they think we need trade. And Tori, maybe this is some of what these, what these Pew research polls are getting at, even if they don't word it that way, maybe that's how some people are thinking about it when they answer the question. So it's not so much free trade, it's fair trade. What, what, what is fair trade as a concept and what kind of uh, problems that create for actual trade? So Tori, I'll let you go first here. Yeah, well, I mean, my first question is fair trade for who? Um, is it fair trade, you know, for a business who might like, who might find it fair to eliminate their competition that's selling things cheaper than them? Uh, is it fair for the employee because they're a union employee and they think everyone, should, you know, they, they think that somebody in Mexico should be, you know, paying, paid the same wage as they are in the United States? Um, it's, and there are other things that are legitimate unfair trade practices like the the use of forced labor which i think is something that anyone who supports free trade would be on board with saying we need to root that out um and and there's a big difference between the idea of of forced labor and just being more competitive uh and that i think is, is a big distinction that we can make a lot of people i think when i when i am you know supporting free trade say with china um come to me and say well they you know they uh are you know enslaving uh, Muslim Uyghurs in Xinjiang, and I'm like, yes, and we should not import products that are made with forced labor. But not everything in China is made with forced labor, um, and and that you know that comes into the problem. And I think that what we what we get at here, which is what kind of what I was talking about a little bit before with the gains from trade, um, is that when we make decisions and promote free trade, which I think is fair because it it puts consumers all at the same level. It allows everyone to compete um, without government intervention. That is fair to me. And it's our job to communicate why that is more fair than all of these, you know, poking holes in the unfairness that's typically more competition than anything else. Adam, if I could make a comment on, on uh, free trade, fair, uh, I would point to this fine issue of a British journal the conservative from June 2017. There's a guy named Hannon who's involved in editing it. And this is my most recent collaboration with him prior to today. But I had the privilege of submitting an, an article called, Who Said There's Anything Fair About Trade? As a practical matter, I, I make the case that there never has been uh, fair trade. Uh, it, it, and other countries always going to be doing something that somebody in our country doesn't like. So yes, we should have negotiations to try to make all countries' policies less trade distorting. Not a problem with that. But the real key to accomplishing free trade is what we do for ourselves. We, if we eliminate our own barriers, we have free trade and greater freedom for our citizens. And as Daniel mentioned with respect to Singapore, it's one of the greatest gifts that we could give our people. And the challenge that we have, those of us who understand 
with the world this way. The challenge we have is getting others to understand it and so that we can get enough votes to make a difference. I mean, the, the, the word fair in, in politics generally is almost meaningless, right? It, because it, it's, it doesn't quite mean equity or proportionality or equality. What it really means is, look, I'm such a nice person. Hey, hey, look at me. You know, it's a kind of narcissism, right? Mirror, mirror on the wall. Who's the fairest of them all, right? It, it, and so in this instance, it's, it's, it's pretty much uh, drained of any, any meaning. I, I just think we, we should be careful of of not accepting a reversal of the burden of proof, right? I'm sure that Dan and Tori both get this because they're, they're, they're both out there uh, at the coalface making these arguments and both doing it brilliantly. But when people say, why are you such an ideological free trader? Why are you such a doctrinaire or dogmatic free trader? Why do you want to subordinate everything to this ideology of yours? Like, do you know what? It, it, like, it really isn't an ideology. It's an absence of ideology. It's like the default. Right, the, the, the basic presumption should be that if you want to sell me something and I want to buy it from you, the authorities need a really good reason to come between us and mess with the terms of our contract. And the fact that you're in another country is not in and of itself a good reason. So it shouldn't be up to us to show why this works, right? It, it, it should be up to the other side to, to justify and demonstrate the proportionality of every prejudice, every distortion that they introduce. And that's a great and that's a great point, Daniel. Um, I do wanna to get to an audience question and actually Daniel, this one's going to be for you. Obviously anyone else is free to comment, but I think Daniel might have the most expertise here. Um, how does the UK view the expiration of trade promotion authority and does that affect any potential for bilateral trade talks, I assume, between the US and the UK? So, I mean, look, I, I, from, a, from a completely selfish point of view, I'm hugely in favor of other countries uh, subsidizing their domestic producers to give me freer stuff, right? I mean, if the US taxpayer wants to give me a gift as a British consumer, thank you very much, I'll take it, right? But I, I, I think that the, 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 that issue arises much more when it comes to things like procurement. I mean, Tory was quite right to say that trade deals these days are about services and they're about you know data flows uh, investor protection mechanisms and so on um we are in the unusual indeed i think unprecedented position as a country of drawing up an independent trade policy after 50 years of having it run by somebody else and this, this is a, you know, it's not every day you get a, you get a, a G7 country doing that, right? This is a G, this is an unfrozen moment. And, and if we use it wisely, the benefits should spread way beyond the UK. I mean, we, 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 we should be able to use Brexit to, to free up a, the, the, the jammed world trading system that you referred to at the beginning. So um, we've just signed a deal with Australia. We're about to sign one with New Zealand. We're about to apply to join the Trans-Pacific Partnership. We're pivoting, if you like, to uh, the faster growing markets and also the markets where we have greater cultural proximity. Uh, one of the things that has been altered, I think probably irrevocably by the lockdown is we're all much more accustomed to doing this. Right? We're all much more accustomed to having important sensitive conversations sometimes by the medium of Zoom or Teams. And, and that I think makes geographical proximity even less relevant than it previously was. It, it puts much more of a premium on cultural proximity. I, I, do, you, do you understand each other, not just linguistically, but in terms of all the kind of unwritten norms and mores that, that surround a deal? So all of that should militate in favor of a seriously cutting edge US-UK deal. And the good news is, as Tory will know, and, and, and indeed as Dan will know, uh, such a deal has been drafted, right? Uh, in 2018, um, a group of 11 think tanks from the US and the UK sat around an oval-shaped table and thrashed out the perfect US-UK trade deal. And, you know, we could do a lot worse than just to give that to Catherine Tai and to, uh, to her UK uh, equivalent, Liz Truss, and say, look, mark off this, right? Take that as your, as your first draft. And what does it do? It basically says whatever is legal in your country should be legal in the other and vice versa. This applies to goods, to services, and to professional credentials. Boom, that's it. That's all you need to do. Yeah, I think that's a great point. And so this is bringing me another, another audience question. So maybe Dan, you can take a first crack at this one. Um, to Daniel's point, the UK is kind of showing how to get trade agreements done. They have the recent agreement with Australia. 
Is there something that the U.S. can learn when it comes to negotiating and entering into bilateral trade agreements from the U.K.'s experience right now, what they're, what they're doing? Well, what we would learn from them is that it's useful actually to do something. <laughs> uh, it, I was disappointed to see that the administration is going to let T the Trade Promotion Authority expire. It's very difficult to negotiate an agreement without it. One of the problems with the Trans-Pacific Partnership was that too much of that was done before there was even a vote on granting negotiating authority, which, which means uh, the ability for Congress to vote up or down on a, an agreement with no amendments, okay? Uh, so, 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 so Tori, it's on the same topic then. It is, so can we learn anything from the UK and then trade promotion authority? So obviously Dan was disappointed. Do you share that view? Or are you also disappointed to see it lapse? Uh, well, quick shameless plug, I actually just released a very large and comprehensive report all about Trade Promotion Authority and a roadmap for Congress on a new Trade Promotion Authority. So check that out on heritage.org. Uh, I can't get through it without shameless plugging. Um, but I, I, I agree, it is a shame that Trade Promotion Authority is expiring. I think it's a very important and useful tool um, for getting trade agreements across the finish line. Um, I do though think that we saw in the USMCA process a lot of problems that need to be addressed in a next Trade Promotion Authority. And that is what my paper completely covers. So I won't bore you with that now. Um, but I think on the UK side, you're probably more likely to see a sort of backdoor US-UK FDA through the TPP than you are to actually see a plain and simple bilateral between the US-UK. Um, I think that will probably be more of a priority in the Biden administration, maybe in like two years, um, but not anything probably before the midterm elections here in the US. And, um, and it doesn't seem like a renewal of TPA or really any new trade agreement negotiations are top of mind for Ambassador Tai. I think we should be aiming to do both, though, Tori. I mean, I agree. The, the, the UK, you know, we, we are in the middle of submitting our uh, CPTPP application. Obviously, we've we've rolled the pitch with all the other governments. There Can you guys define some of these acronyms just for people listening who may not be so, familiar with them? As yeah, you guys sorry, are. The, so the, the, this is the what was the Trans-Pacific Partnership. It is a, a trade nexus uh, that includes Canada, Australia, New Zealand, Mexico, Peru, Vietnam, and others. Uh, but at the insistence of Justin Trudeau, for reasons that I've never fully got my head around, it, it is now called the uh, the Comprehensive and Progressive Trans-Pacific Partnership, CPTPP. Um, it's, you know, it, it, it's a pretty good deal as far as it goes. It, it's not perfect, but it is, it's largely about mutual recognition and it is largely about, uh, you know, removing barriers rather than trying to harmonize things. Uh, it, it is, however, um, wide rather than deep. Yeah. So in order to include Mexico and Australia and so on, it, it uh, it's good at removing tariffs and, and removing some of the more obvious trade barriers. It's not so good at some of the services and digital stuff. So within the Trans-Pacific Partnership, you can have deeper arrangements. And probably the supreme one in the world, I, I think probably my, my favorite trade agreement, I mean, like, you know, like, like you guys in a perfect world, I wouldn't have trade agreements, I just have unilateral free trade, but, it, but in so far as, uh, as, the, as we're dealing in, in, in an imperfect Aristotelian uh, fallen and sublunary world, the Australian-New Zealand uh, deal, if you, if you think CPTPP is a tough acronym, it's, it's gone through, it's now called ANSERTA, it's gone through a gazillion different acronyms, basically uh, it's called Closer Economic Relations. That is about as thorough as they come, and it, it basically just provides the complete mutual legality, reciprocity, and it flips the burden of proof so that everything is assumed to be legal, and if you, if you then want to challenge something, you have to go through quite a difficult process to show that it shouldn't be in it. That has happened. I mean, there was some move by Australian apple growers against New Zealand apple growers at some point, and I think there was some dispute about the point at which uh, alternative and homeopathic medicines have to be registered as if they were chemical. Maybe. Yeah, I'll take that. I mean, if, if that's the limit to free trade, I will grab that gladly with both hands. So, so what, what Australia and New Zealand are showing is that nestling within the wider Pacific nexus, 
you can also have a world-beating trade deal. Now, what I'm hoping for is that as well as joining the Pacific Nexus, the UK will get much closer to Australia and New Zealand, and in due course also to Canada. And at that point, I wonder whether it doesn't become a bit more attractive for the US to enter into a very close relationship with countries that have the same GDP level, that obviously have the same language, the common law, et cetera. None of the sort of Trumpy objections to trade apply. Even if they've been true, they don't apply in, in, in this case. And I wonder whether that might be something for further down the line once, and, and I, I do hope the, the US will reconsider its, its decision not to, to go ahead with the, the Pacific Partnership. If only, I'm sorry to, to, to take so long, but if only because pulling out of the Trans-Pacific Partnership opened the door to China to create a rival trade bloc, which is not in anyone's interest. Awesome. Well, we have to stop there. 50 minutes fly by when you're having a great time. Um, this was a very informative discussion. I really enjoyed all of you taking the time to chat with us. Um, and I guess the big takeaway here at the last minute is when you're looking towards free trade agreements, what looks good, look to Australia and New Zealand. Uh, they, have a, they have a good blueprint there that maybe more countries should be adopting. So thank you all for joining us. Really enjoyed it. Um, and uh, glad you're able to come and chat with us today. Thank you again to the panelists for the great conversation so far. And thank you to Adam.